The Admiral's Cup is the world's most prized offshore racing trophy. This year sees more potential cup boats launched than ever before, but the yachts face stiff competition in selection trials for one of three places in their national teams. Australian and New Zealand boats make the long voyage to England as deck cargo. Modern hulls are much lighter, yet stiffer and stronger than their predecessors, thanks to new techniques using honeycomb cores, Kevlar and carbon fibre. Reputations of top designers are at stake in this classic series. New Zealander Bruce Farr is responsible for four out of the six Antipodean yachts. On these racing machines, all weight, including deck fittings, is paired to a minimum, with ultralight titanium used for pulpits, shackles and tillers, and strong Kevlar cord rope for halyards and control lines. Danish stockbroker was launched just in time to sail to cows for the races. But Coram's French crew have spent many weekends sailing in England, testing the opposition. She's skippered by her designer, Philippe Briand, who also designed the America's Cup 12-metre French Kiss. Nicht die Linie. The German holders of the cup are trying for a record three wins in succession, with yachts designed by their successful partnership of Judel and Vrolik. But selectors in Kiel know that the opposition will be tougher than ever before. Two of the runners-up will sail for the Austrian team. British trialists are joined by French and Irish team hopefuls, giving an extra edge to the competition and allowing the yachts to tune up against each other. Jamarella, Juno and Full Pelt are fighting for two remaining places in the UK team. Full Pelt is the loser, but is quickly chartered by a newspaper for the Irish team to join her sister ship, Jameson Whiskey. Jamarella, designed by Bruce Farr, has a wealth of talent aboard, with Olympic gold medalist Rodney Patterson and America's Cup helmsman Laurie Smith. Cows, traditional Isle of Wight home of British yachting, celebrates the 30th anniversary of the Admiral's Cup, run by the Royal Ocean Racing Club and sponsored by Champagne Mum. 
and Castor Marina is filled to overflowing with Cowsweek yachts, augmented by the 42 cup boats from 14 nations as keen sailors from all over the world meet together to enjoy top-level international racing. For the first time, sponsorship is playing a major role. From Swiss watches to whiskey, from beer to banking, multicoloured banners create a commercial atmosphere that might well have had the old guard of the exclusive Royal Yacht Squadron turn in their graves. The Admiral's Cup uses a handicap rating system based on the international offshore rule that allows a great variety of craft of different sizes to race competitively against each other. To fit the size requirements, most teams have chosen two smaller boats of around 40 feet, known as one-tonners, and a bigger yacht of about 44 feet overall. With more money available, the boats are better prepared than ever before. The smoother the finish, the faster the yacht will slip through the water. All boats are carefully scrutinised by Royal Ocean Racing Club officials. With designers constantly pushing rules to the limit, the measurer uses a pressure device to check the radius of curvature at specific points on the hull. Sponsors' logos are subject to strict regulations on size. The watch has to go, while the distorted lines of some boats seem designed to mislead the tape measure. Ashore, there's a great feeling of conviviality with space for beer tents and barbecues where international crews can enjoy meeting fellow competitors. On the eve of the first race, all preparations are nearly complete, ready for the big day tomorrow. Disaster strikes the Danish team at the 11th hour. Andelsbanken has broken her mast in two places in a late afternoon sail. If she misses the race tomorrow, she'll jeopardise the chances of the entire Danish team. The lightweight, glued and riveted spar is carried off for a night of intensive care in the workshop. But can the damaged sections possibly be repaired in time? Dehumidifiers drying out the boats overnight can produce over half a bucket of water from a single race.
crews psyched up for competition face a frustrating delay of two and a half hours waiting for the breeze to fill in. this level of competition, good starts are essential. But German Diva is in trouble from the outset, squeezed up against the boy. The first leg brings the time of reckoning. As each boat checks her performance against rivals with a similar handicap rating, many private duels will emerge that will last throughout the series. The light nor'westerly brings a race full of surprises. Many favoured boats, including Sadad and her German teammates, are doing less well than expected. The Danes are showing well, much relieved to be sailing with a full team after successful overnight repairs to that broken mast. Way down amongst the one-tonners is big American yacht Blue Yankee, but French Centurion and her near sister ship Juno sailing for the UK seem evenly matched. Marissa Konica, top boat in the Italian trials, keeps company with Swan Premium 3 from Australia, steered by Ian Murray, helmsman of America's Cup defender Kookaburra. 44-foot Cayman is sailing for Holland, who have the highest combined handicap rating in the fleet. In conditions favouring the bigger boats, at the end of the day, honours will be remarkably evenly spread, with yachts from 11 nations filling the top 12 places. The Jeppersen designed ex-boats from Denmark with their beautiful see-through spinnakers have the backing of a newly emerging home yacht industry from sail and mast makers to electronics. The Danes are first despite the setback of the evening before and top individual scorer is their big boat original Beckmann's Plettfjerner. Gone is the navigator's table below. His place now is on deck, button punching to call up information from the onboard computer, wind and boat speed and navigational readouts. Thank you. 
all non-competing yachts and competing yachts keep clear of the distance and starting mark layers. Keep clear of the outer distance and inner distance mark layers. Christchurch Bay is the new venue for the second inshore race and it's time for the Coram Trophy. France and America fight it out at the windward mark. The Americans on the inside carry on well past the boy, forcing the French to sail wide. After the initial Olympic triangle, the yachts are racing several times round a sausage-shaped loop between the upwind and downwind marks, sailing a total distance a little over 28 and a half miles. British Indulgence is racing with top yachtsman Harold Cudmore and Eddie Warden Orne on board. At the start of each downwind run, the tactician has to decide which side of the course will be more favourable. Jameson Whiskey does a jibe set to go off to the left. The Danish twins appear inseparable in the long procession of smaller boats. Being evenly matched in size, the one-tonners all too often find tactics being dictated by other yachts, whereas the greater variety in size of the bigger boats allows them to sail in clearer air most of the time. As always, the Italians sail with flourish. Racing for Italy, Mandrake is a Philip Brion design, while Turkish Delight is from the board of Tony Castro and is one of three chartered yachts sailing for Ireland in their 11th Admiral's Cup Challenge. New Zealand's propaganda, superbly sailed, is rapidly proving herself the fastest one-tonner in the fleet, helped by America's Cup tactician Brad Butterworth from Kiwi Magic. Sidewinder from the USA was third in the first race and is again showing her superiority on the inshore circuit. Coram, flagship of the French team, sets her spinnaker in stops. France has never won the Admiral's Cup, despite having missed only one series in 30 years.
Despite zealous marshals, enthusiastic spectators are crowding in on the yachts rounding the mark in the strong tide. The dinghy's engine has stopped. He's going to get a closer close-up than he bargained for. In this highly competitive fleet, it's all too easy to take a risk that leads to a protest, followed by a penalty that will set the whole team back. Now in the melee of yachts converging once more on the downwind mark, Rytek Ponciana trips her spinnaker and it streams back astern as she's forced the wrong side of the buoy. The rebellious spinnaker engulfs the buoy, temporarily stopping the boat. In the confusion, as the crew try to free themselves, it's man overboard. The Kiwis reap the benefit of consistent teamwork with third and tenth positions backing up propaganda's win. In the series, the New Zealanders are now a single point behind the British, while the Danes have dropped to fourth behind the Australians. The presentation party for the Coram Trophy is a right royal occasion aboard the grand old J-class yacht, Velshida. King Constantine presents the trophy won by propaganda to the New Zealanders. Appropriately, it's based on a ship's chronometer. Prince Philip, in cows for the racing, collects his cousin. The ceremonial departure by Pinnace conjures up memories of Velshida's glorious past. A windless Christchurch Bay delays the start of the third inshore race for two hours, causing the committee to set a course far to the south, with the windward mark right out in the strong currents of the English Channel. The British team, with their slender one-point lead, lose any advantage of racing in the familiar waters of the bay. Once the southwesterly sea breeze has set in, the wind increases to a spanking 16 knots, giving an afternoon of glorious yacht racing. This is what they've come from all over the world to enjoy.
onboard computer enables the navigator to calculate apparent wind speed for the next leg. But the strength of the flooding channel stream at the windward mark catches out many very experienced tacticians. New Zealand Gold Corp keeps out of trouble, having forged her way upwind to the top end of the fleet, and she's holding her own now with the bigger boats on the downwind legs. Boat after boat will misjudge this starboard tack ley line. Indulgence gets it right. But her UK teammates will get involved in a barrage of protests that will keep the jury busy until the following afternoon after a traffic jam at the boy. Many crews being swept onto the mark are forced to tack away at the last minute. while the hapless diva seems stuck to the boy. The German cup holder's hopes finally disappear before the eyes of the world's press. Another German yacht, Pinta, sailing for Austria, suffers the same fate with a crew more accustomed to sailing in the tideless Baltic. Propaganda, like her teammate Gold Corp, sails well ahead of the confusion lower down the fleet, and the outstanding Kiwi team race firmly into top place. The American Insatiable, one of only two masthead sloops in the race, is the individual winner. The scrutineers offer congratulations and some beer for thirsty crew members. It's a fitting victory on the 30th anniversary of the Cup founded by Britain and America in 1957. The skipper wins his own weight in champagne. So much for the inshore racing, but the Admiral's Cup is also an offshore series, finishing with the classic Fastnet race, 605 miles from Cowes to Ireland and back to Plymouth. Accountants and sailmakers, students and engineers sit cheek by cheek on the rail as they set out on a race that will keep them at sea for at least four days and nights. Jameson Whiskey and the Irish team are on their way to fourth place in the series. Blue Yankee, smallest of the American boats, has had a disappointing week. But Jamarella, star of the UK team, will finish in second place overall. And Sidewinder will take the prize for best boat on the inshore races. Container and her German teammates are recovering their confidence to sail into fifth place. Original Beckmans will be top scoring big boat of the series.
Mylar sails, reinforced with Kevlar, have to be carefully handled to avoid damage. And below decks, wet spinnakers need equally careful repacking by the crew to make sure they're ready for the next hoist, which might well be in the dark. In these stripped-out racing machines, all weight is kept out of the ends of the boats and living conditions during the fastnet are spartan, to say the least. Still, a third of the voyage is completed as the yachts approach Lizard Point. The Ronald Stone Boy brings one of the major navigational decisions of the race. Should they sail outside the Scillies or take the more direct course to the north of the islands? Most skippers choose the latter as a front is forecast, promising a reach to the fastnet. The Longships Lighthouse near Land's End marks one of the most dangerous coastlines in Britain. The New Zealanders, despite their comfortable points lead, know the British team are formidable rivals offshore and Kiwi is carefully covering indulgence throughout the race. The crew of the Seven Stones Lightship enjoy a grandstand view of the Fastnet fleet. The French stage a fast winching demonstration aboard Coram as their chef gets to work in the cockpit. Bon appétit! Insatiable is one of the few yachts to sail south of the Scilly Isles on the way out in the hope of picking up the promised wind change earlier. But the lottery does not pay off, and she loses time. The unpredictable weather plays a key role in the famous race. Yachts taking the direct route across the Irish Sea benefit most, with the Irish team doing particularly well in their home waters. Racing offshore, precise navigation plays a major role. The fast net is an isolated rock off the southwest coast of Ireland. Strong tidal streams can sweep an unwary crew too far west, and there's a busy shipping lane to cross at right angles. Making a good landfall is essential. The Fastnet Lighthouse, highlight of the voyage and turning point of the race. Despite all the vital electronic aids, there's nothing more cheering to the navigator than a positive sighting to fix the yacht's position on the chart, confirming the waypoint. On the return voyage, the course lies south of the Scillies. The reaching conditions ideally suit the one-tonners who take over the lead from the bigger yachts, heading back to the next mark, Bishop's Rock Lighthouse. After the lonely Wolf Rock, the course for the last leg lies back along the Cornish coast. Plymouth Breakwater brings the end of the Fastnet race. The end of the Admiral's Cup. And the end of the fine weather. Dripping sails are re-hoisted to blow dry in the breeze while rain-soaked sailors receive a warm welcome in the new marina at Queen Anne's Battery.
in the Guildhall delighted New Zealanders from the little country that has sailed to the very top of world yachting are at last presented with the cup they have strived so long to win. Don Brook, team manager, proudly bears the trophy off to its new home at the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, a splendid tribute to the crews of Kiwi, Propaganda and Gold Corp, who came halfway across the world to win the Admiral's Cup.